So this painting will take a little bit of time um, to be able to explain the context. Um, and I should mention this painting by Ren Xiang is self-portrait is probably been the one Chinese painting that has more um, scholarly ink spilled on it than any other. Uh, this has been written about in books uh, and in various articles through time. Uh, and you'll kind of see why, because it's very complex as far as how it deals with the situation. Uh, so Ren Qiang himself is from Shanghai, which is the um, one of the centralized places where the Opium War was happening uh, in 1840, and then there was a second Opium War as well. And the Opium Wars were between the British and the Chinese, uh, and what the British wanted to do was have direct access to Chinese markets, opium being one of them. Uh, they didn't want to have to deal with taxes. They didn't want to have to deal with the Chinese government telling them what they could do. They wanted to be able to extract and sell uh, resources exactly uh, as they desired. Um, so both of the wars were lost by the Chinese, and many people uh, looked at the Qing government, uh, which many saw as foreigners, and said, uh, these people can't protect us. Um, these imperialists are coming in and they're weak uh, and they're not following the old traditions and that's why things are the way they are. Um, and Xiang uh, perhaps was not loyal to the Qings. He had family that were part of the Ming dynasty. So he may looking at this foreign dynasty of Manchurians uh, and not thinking that they were the best. Uh, so the other thing that was going on at this time, uh, which is pretty complicated, is the Taiping Rebellion, which was an extremely violent and lethal rebellion um, in the right before this time and during this time uh, in the 1850s and 60s in China. And I should mention that the later Republican and Communist governments of China will see this as the first steps for their, their revolutions. And you'll kind of see why I want to explain it. So Hong Shi Quan, uh, he was just a regular guy uh, and he wanted to take the civil service exams, wanted to move up. Um, and he studied and studied and took the civil service exam and failed, and then studied some more and failed again. He became depressed and dejected, stopped eating, he even stopped drinking water. Uh, and as you might expect, he started to become weak and to even hallucinate. Um, in his house, he had some of this propaganda that Christian missionaries have been passing out, and he started to have visions. Uh, again, a thing that would be common for people who are starving themselves and not drinking enough water. And in, in these visions, he uh, considered himself to be the brother of Jesus Christ, uh, and he had to convert all the Chinese. So normally when I heard this story in other classes, that's where it would stop. And I think that's an incredibly simplistic way of looking at what happened. Uh, instead, I think you should look at the other things that Hang Shia Kuan got out of Christianity, uh, and was trying to spread to people. Um, the first thing is that um, in Christianity, like if you read the Gospels, uh, there's a lot of gender equality. Women have power. They're, be, they're able to control their own lives. Uh, and um, Hang Shia Kwan, that's, that's the way it should be, uh, that women, if they have an abusive husband, they should be able to divorce him, that they shouldn't have to live with his family, uh, that they should have more control over their household. Uh, so you can imagine how many women would find this appealing. Um, he also talked to peasants and he said, um, you know, he looked at the, the Bible where it says that the rich man could not possibly go to heaven, um, that, uh, you know, the meek shall inherit the earth. And he said, um, look at your landlords that are controlling your life and you slave away for them and they take all of your work. Um, you can... Uh, rise up against them and take control of your own fields, of your own work, uh, of your own neighborhoods, of your own communities. Uh, so, you know, this is a pretty, kill your landlord is a pretty easy sell for people. Uh, so, and also being able to control their own lives um, and not have to worry about what's given to them or taken from them by elites. Uh, so at first, um, this worked pretty well. You converted a lot of people. Um, but as you move from town to town, uh, elites became concerned, obviously because of the uh, anti-landlord uh, type of um, ideas in this rebellion. Um, so they started to fight back. And sometimes they were able to get people who were um, in the uh, 
the people in the rebellion's own family. Um, a Chinese scholar was talking about this and said about how it was literally brother against brother. Uh, so over time, the violence rose, um, and um, the rebels, Hong Shia Kuan's people, began to become more violent. Uh, and supposedly they were going from town to town, uh, and they were kidnapping women um, and taking them as wives or just raping them. Uh, so women would hear about um, them approaching and would sometimes commit suicide to avoid this. Uh, and over time, uh, as the elites responded with more violence, uh, Hong Shia Kwan's people responded with more violence, and the bodies started to pile up. Um, the Chinese scholar that... Uh, I was reading about said that at the time people wrote that um, the Qing government sent out people to go into the south into the towns to see what was happening uh, and they would be approaching a town down river and they would see bodies floating down the river and when they would get to the town there'd be nobody left they put the bodies in the river because there was no one left to bury the bodies so at the end of it at least 25 million people were killed perhaps 50 perhaps as many as a hundred million um, and this is in a population of 450 million or so. Uh, so an incredible amount of violence, it's almost unimaginable. So many people, um, especially people who may have been part of um, the earlier Chinese ruling dynasty looked at these Manchurian Qing leaders and said, these foreigners, they're not, they're weak. Uh, they're not following the old traditions. Uh, they um, say they are, but uh, they left us open to these Western imperialists, to their religion that was taking away our traditions, which had protected us. So I'll read the translation of this poem, and you'll get a kind of idea of what's going on. Because the Qing government at this time, um, after the rebellion, really tried to clamp down on media. Uh, and um, there was no free speech. You weren't allowed to speak against the Qing government. So in this poem, uh, we see something... Um, not quite straightforward, but if you read between the lines, you can see what Ren Xiang is saying. So, let's read this poem. So, with the world in turmoil, what lies ahead of me? I smile and bow and go around flattering people in hope of making connections. But what do I know of affairs and the great confusion? What is there to hold on to and rely on? How easy is it to merely chat about this? When I calculate back to my youth, I didn't start out thinking this way with a sense of purpose I portrayed the ancients for display as paragons. But who are the ignorant ones? Who are the sages? In the end, I have no idea. In the flash of a glance, all I can see is the boundless void. So you can see that Ren Qiang is kind of struggling here, but he's also not laying down in this struggle. He says, I smile and bow and go around flattering people in hope of making connections. But what do I know of affairs? Um, how easy it is to merely chat about this. When people say, oh, we could just talk about it. The other side of that is, or we could fight. And then he talks about how uh, with a sense of purpose, he just read the ancients as paragons, but who are the ignorant ones? Who are the sages? perhaps pointing up to the Qing government. In the end, I have no idea in a flash of a glance, all I can see is a boundless void. So you can imagine how depressing it would be to live during this time, but at the same time, we see this mixture of Western and Chinese styles. Uh, we can see uh, the Western style like we saw from uh, Castellone and his body up here, but his face is also, he's very like thin, um, rangy. He's looking very aggressive, uh, aggressively at us. And then when we look at the Chinese lines, the Chinese styles, they are aggressive too, much more jagged than anything we had seen. So you can see the kind of like turmoil and perhaps the will to fight um, in this painting. Uh, so a fascinating picture. So modern China uh, from 1911. So in 1911, there was a Republican revolution. Uh, and if you're not aware, the Republican government is the same type of government the United States has. Um, and as you might, you might not be surprised, the United States was heavily supporting this Republican revolution. Um, and it was successful, uh, but also uh, people, um, especially as the Great Depression hit, um, people became uh, less and less confident in the government and the government responded by being more autocratic uh, and putting down um, rebellions as they, as they popped up. 
So that was interrupted with the invasions of Japan by, by Japan of China. Uh, they started out with Manchuria in the 20s, uh, and then they eventually made their way into Beijing in 1937. Uh, so for China, World War II is starting long before it does for Europe. Um, and in, once World War II started, uh, Japan invaded uh, the rest of China and tried to occupy as much as possible. And um, like the Nazis, they killed um, millions of civilians, uh, just not even for uprisings, just lined them up and killed them uh, to let the Chinese know that there would be no um, fighting against the Japanese. So the result of World War II, uh, as we all know, is that the Japanese lost. Uh, we'll talk about that in more detail when we get to Japan. Um, and at the end of it, um, um, Mao, who was the leader of a socialist uh, groups, um, he started to go into the countryside and convince people that um, of the ideals of socialism. Uh, and again, kind of like what we saw with Hong Xiaquan, this is an easy sell. Because uh, in the Republican government, it was still elites that were running things. Uh, many people in the countryside were working themselves to death uh, and not getting much out of it. Uh, so he was able to move from countryside to countryside and eventually build up an army. Uh, and through a great heroic battle, he likes to tell the stories, but there really was uh, a lot of um, very intense uh, losses to go along with the wins. Eventually, uh, Mao prevailed, and in 1949, he declared the People's Republic of China. Uh, so Mao himself is a Marxist, uh, but you can't really look at China and say that uh, what he created was instant communism. Uh, Marxists believe that you have to develop capitalism first uh, to its end before you can reach uh, socialism and then communism. Uh, so, but he did believe that... Um, people on the countryside uh, should be able to uh, get more um, out of their work. Uh, and they did gather up elites uh, and put them in jail or kill them. Uh, so he did try to create um, more people power. And then in the 1950s, uh, he stepped aside. And people took over in China who were also Marxist, but very similar to the Chinese government today. Uh, after um, a few years, Mao thought that the revolution was dying, uh, that people were becoming, um, that they had too many bourgeois values, meaning values of the ownership class, uh, and he instituted the Cultural Revolution in 1965, which lasted until uh, after Mao's death um, in the mid-70s, until 1979. In the Cultural Revolution, the idea was to re-educate uh, the Chinese people. He thought, especially intellectuals, uh, and other people that were pretty well off before the revolution and still were, um, that they needed to be, uh, have more revolutionary thoughts and feelings. Uh, so he sent some of them to the fields to work with farmers uh, to be re-educated. As you might imagine, when you have a bunch of like um, people that are trained to do administrative jobs or trained as artists, one of the artists we're going to look at like that, they didn't do so well in the farms. Uh, and unfortunately, there was also a drought during this time. So this led to um, a famine. But Mao was able to control uh, some of the information. And in the Cultural Revolution, he tried to create propaganda that um, showed that everything was okay and this, this revolution was moving along very well. Um, so during this time, from the beginning of the People's Republic of China uh, until the Cultural Revolution, um, all of the work that could be made in China was what's called socialist realism. And socialist realism, you can look it up on Google, is really more of a romantic style. It's very similar to 19th century romanticism. Um, and the idea with it is to show just the good things, this idealistic vision of the revolution. Uh, and to show, and I'll give you some examples so we can see it a little better on, uh, later on. So this particular piece, the statue was for his mausoleum. And oftentimes I ask the class, like, what messages are being portrayed here? And they look at him and they say, he's sitting in an easy chair. He seems relaxed. But he's also, you know, this is monumental. It's really big size and he's above everyone. He has this kind of like gentle, authoritative grandfather type vibe to him. And that's exactly what Mao wanted to portray. Um, so his image and writings were mass-produced ad infinum. 
Uh, his writings were in this thing that, that's kind of nicknamed the Little Red Book. Uh, and there's literally hundreds of millions of copies of it. Um, and it's more printings of that than, than any, anything than the Quran and the Bible. Uh, and they also tried to mass produce some of these propaganda images using industrial um, methods. So using industrial paints. Uh, and the artists at this time, they would learn how to create um, these naturalistic images in the social realist style. So naturalistic, but romantic at the same time. So let's take a look at typical image. Um, so this is what you would see. This is warmly hailed the successful opening of the Fourth People's Congress. In 1971, it was already pretty bad in the countryside and a lot of people were very hungry and thin uh, and people in the city were kind of um, separated from that, but there were messages that were coming in. So we wanted to control these messages and show everything going very well. Uh, so in a way we can see there's some naturalism here, but the romanticism comes from um, this particular type of composition where we see Mao at the top, again, having this kind of like gentle but authoritative look on his face. And then everyone, these incredibly healthy and everyone's got like big hands and shiny faces and great white teeth and incredible um, arms. Everyone's strong and powerful uh, and happy and looking towards the future. Uh, so in a way, it's a romantic style. It's showing an emotion. Uh, and when you say socialist realism, it's not really realism. The realist movement in the 19th century in Europe was about showing things how they are. And this is more showing of things about how they could be with um, if people followed Mao's cultural revolution. So this is another example. Uh, Mao himself as a person was pretty big for a mid-century Chinese person. He was 5'10". Uh, so it's accurate to show him as taller, but even if he was shorter than most people, he would still be shown as slightly taller. Uh, and we can see him, again, we have these, <laughs> it's incredible, all these farmers are working out hard and they have these incredible square jaws. Uh, everybody is happy and healthy and sturdy and the white teeth and smiles and rosy cheeks uh, and everything is being productive in the background, uh, lots of food. Uh, and Mao is both part of the people uh, but also leading them. He's wearing um, Chinese espadrilles, but he's also wearing Western clothes. Uh, and Mao kind of realized that even though he was an anti-colonial uh, type of revolution, uh, expressly so, explicitly so, uh, he also knew that people saw the West as being progressive. Uh, so he tried to take that kind of idea and move it forward. Um, so even in China, uh, the effects of Orientalism will be used to create imagery. And again, we can see this romantic style, this composition that's a pyramid like we had seen previously, leading up to the top and then center with Mao. So his image was produced so much uh, that the pop artist Andy Warhol used it in some of these icon images they created in different colors. Uh, so when we get to the 80s, uh, post Mao, things become a little bit more complicated. Um, the Chinese government was still run by Marxists, but more like the people that had run the government um, in between um, Mao's reigns in the 1950s. Uh, and they believed that capitalism had to be fully developed in China for it eventually for it to reach socialism. Uh, so they did certain things that um, enhanced capital concentration. They allowed people to become wealthy. China now has uh, more billionaires, um, maybe even than the United States, but more billionaires than in every other country in the world. Um, and the idea still today, uh, they, they call it <laughs> um, socialism with Chinese characteristics, is that uh, you have to keep developing capitalism to its end, spread it worldwide, and eventually um, socialism will come out of that almost inevitably like a, a historical machine. Um, so, you know, many people in China are skeptical of this and many people believe in it and most people are probably in between. Um, China is different than the other capitalist countries in that in the last, uh, in 2008 and the last worldwide depression, we're going into another one right now in 2020, but the last one, uh, instead of cutting, um, state welfare programs, they did the opposite. They actually upped the state welfare programs. Uh, and there are a lot fewer people that are in poverty in China, but 
it really is capitalist. Most people um, work for a wage, uh, and you know we still have elite people at the top that are running things. So post Mao, uh, they along with these kind of like market and political changes, uh, you also see that artists can do more of what they wanted. But they took their training, so they had training in socialist realism when you create these naturalistic images, and they took it and they tried to make, in the case of Lu Zhang Li, a hyper-realism, uh, like influenced by Chuck Close. Uh, and I'll show you one of his pictures in a moment. Uh, so his idea was to show the real Chinese peasant. So instead of the shiny, happy people that Mao was putting in the propaganda, he wanted to show this is hard work. These people, when they get old, they're out in the sun all day, and it's written in their face, in their skin color. Uh, this man, and he's missing teeth. Uh, he's just trying to get his bowl of soup uh, in China. Peasants, when they're going to work a long day, they have a very hot, very salty bowl of soup. Um, but when you look at this picture, almost everything in it um, could be exactly what you would see in a Chinese peasant a thousand years ago. But one thing sticks out a little bit. See if you can pick it out. So Chuck Close, uh, he used to make pictures by taking a grid uh, and then painting inside of the grid. And that way you could create this hyper-realism. And Zhang Li uh, had also learned how to do that to make these massive propaganda images before. So now that he was free, he used this technique, uh, put it on canvas like Chuck Close to create this incredible realism to show things Mm, aren't quite what was in the propaganda. So if you haven't noticed, the thing that sticks out is the pen. Uh, so during the Mao era, the idea was to, um, it wasn't always the most efficient, but sometimes it worked, uh, was to gather up everything that the farmers produced and then the centralized government would distribute it. Not necessarily the best idea sometimes, uh, but not the most horrible idea either. So the thing that doesn't belong is the pen, uh, but that's because he would have to mark everything down uh, in modern China. So kind of ironically, Lu Zhangli is trying to show peasants as they actually live. Um, Lu Zhangli is one of the most expensive artists in the current Chinese market. Uh, one of his paintings uh, just sold for $2 million um, at auction in China. Uh, and you see it as a massive scale, just like Chuck Close, uh, much larger in human, but that way you can see all these incredible details. So the last artist we'll talk about is an artist we saw on the first day, that's Hung Lu. Uh, and I'm gonna post a video that you can check out uh, from uh, Hung Lu when she's talking about her art. It's from um, a while back, um, but it gives you a good idea of where she's at at the time uh, and what she's working towards. Uh, so it's from KQED, a public station in San Francisco, uh, and she lives in the Bay Area today. She was born in China, and she actually spent the Cultural Revolution in the countryside. She was sent by the Chinese government as a photographer, and she also made drawings. She was trained as a Chinese artist, uh, just as the other Chinese artists I talked about, to create this massive propaganda, but not in a Chinese style. She didn't really learn Chinese styles of art until she moved to the United States, and she ended up staying here, uh, going through graduate school and becoming an artist. Um, so she makes all of her pictures from photos. And in later times, she actually started using videos in real time, which is kind of amazing. Um, she says, I'm not copying photographs. I release information from them. Uh, so this one we had talked about on the first day and the second day of class, um, that prostitution is the subject. Uh, she, Hung Lu went back to China and she collected a bunch of Qing Dynasty era photos. Uh, and we can tell that just by the clothing that's being worn. Um, and a lot of them were photos of sex workers. Uh, and that's what's being shown here. Uh, we had talked about in uh, previous classes about how the virgin vessel title kind of fits um, what the sex worker do because she's not doing this by choice. Uh, in a way, she's a virgin. She's never had sex by choice, but she's also a vessel. She's used by Johns uh, to get what they want. And you can see that vessel um, being illustrated, how she is used as a vessel um, inside of the vessel that's on her shirt. So this early style, we can see she's using archaic Chinese calligraphy 
um, but it's still very pretty standard painting style. Um, it's not quite as expressive of what she would use later on. So over time, she would mix more and more expressive elements in, especially paint drips. Uh, and they'll talk about that in the video. Again, I'll put a link for that. Um, so in this one, it's the concubines of the royal court, or the consorts, in other words, the girlfriends. Uh, and remember what I said about um, the Forbidden City during the Qing Dynasty. The emperor, his wife, and all of his girlfriends, once they got to the city, they could never leave. Uh, so when they were in the city, they lived in these beautiful areas like I showed you. Uh, they had the finest clothes, the best food. Um, they literally had someone wipe their bums for, for them after they pooped. <laughs> like they didn't have to do anything. But at the same time, they were trapped. Uh, they couldn't move. Uh, so a lot of times students will perceive this as a kind of sadness with these paint drips. And the video will show in detail how those paint drips are made. They go on usually towards the end of the painting. Um, and they look beautiful, but they're caged. These are literal bird cages. And why bird cages and not some other kind of cage? Because uh, think about it. When people keep birds in cages, they take someone that can fly, an animal that can fly, but that is also beautiful. They clip its wings, and it can't be fully itself. Uh, so you can kind of see that in the sadness and loss uh, that comes out of this. Um, she talks about relationships of power and she says, I want to dissolve them in my paintings. Um, so the contrast that she has here, we do have um, some very kind of like Western styles, uh, some you know, styles that you would see uh, that have been developing in China for a while, but also things that are more like what we've seen in Chinese traditions. The drips are only slightly controllable. Um, she uses more and more expressive paint strokes. In the video, you'll see how she's using singular strokes with multiple colors in her later paintings. Um, so a lot of styles coming together in this one, but remember the Chinese style she actually learned in the US. So this one we had talked about in the, um, in the in-class assignment, but if you didn't make it to that Zoom call, students came up with some fascinating things. We have, you can pick out, we have Van Gogh over here, paintings. Uh, and then we have pictures of Marx, Engels, um, Lenin, and Stalin. Everyone always picks out Stalin the first. Thank you, memes. Uh, what's pictured here are literal clocks on these little Ikea-like shelves, uh, these revolutionary clocks. Uh, the reason why they're called revolutionary clocks is because in the Mao era, um, you would get everything you needed, like basics for your household from the government. Uh, they collected everything and redistributed it. Um, but they called all the household items revolutionary. So you'd have a toaster, it would be a revolutionary toaster. You have an oven, it's a revolutionary oven. Uh, and you have a clock that everyone had. These were made by the hundreds of millions. Uh, they'd be revolutionary clocks. Um, so students have lots of different ideas. They look at this side and they say, wow, there's a lot of expression here. There's these Zen strokes that are coming out. Uh, there's some density. Uh, there's uh, a bodhisattva floating around here. And then it's all Van Gogh, who's a very expressive and colorful but tortured artist. Sometimes people look at Hung Lu and they say she's a little darker here than she is here. They look at the other side and they see um, there's not as much going on. Maybe it's more organized. Uh, but it doesn't seem to have as much expression coming out. Um, so a lot of times students will see this and they'll say, oh, well, she's anti-communist. She's looking at um, these Marxist uh, leaders and saying um, they're leading to me not saying much or not having much. Um, but I think that would be uh, a hard, a difficult conclusion to make. Uh, Hung Lu herself considers herself a socialist. She's fond of wearing the socialist star. Um, and she uh, may just consider um, this kind of more authoritarian socialism uh, that these figures advocated as squashing creativity. Um, whereas Van Gogh, who also like, um, had ideas that were very socialist, he rarely talked about it, but um, the types of ideas he had were that people should have more power and more space to be able to have creativity. Uh, we're very socialist at the time. Um, so maybe looking at the world and saying, we can do better. 
uh, than this. It doesn't have to be this way. Uh, and maybe we can be more creative, but also it's more complicated. Things could go bad. Things could be good. We also see more drips, which remember, again, can be sadness, but it's also kind of movement. Whereas over here, she's a little bit faded. There aren't as many drips. It's more organized. Um, so maybe uh, a lot of times uh, authoritarian Marxists, they say, well, this type of bottom-up type of socialism is fine, but it's not organized enough. Um, so perhaps saying that this section is organized. You also notice that in this symmetry, she even matches the colors as if you were to fold it over and they would match blue, 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 and then yellow, yellow. Yellow was Van Gogh's favorite colors. He saw it as um, the sun and the source of everything that is good. So a lot of things going on. People even commented that perhaps the clocks, uh, that there's ones that are really organized here as opposed to ones that seem to be a little bit more faded uh, speak to this complexity. Uh, so maybe not saying one side is, is better than the other, uh, but describing uh, the different ways of looking at creativity or socialism or however, or herself. So as she progressed, she became more and more expressive, used brighter and brighter colors. Uh, she used, um, she started to project images and have them change and try to paint them in time. Uh, these ones are images that she took herself during the Cultural Revolution when she was in the fields. So you can see people working, but then all of this other stuff going on. We have the lotus, and um, I'll talk about the symbolism in that in Buddhism later on, but it represents the journey of a Buddhist. A lotus grows in the mud and then has makes this beautiful flower. Um, and then we see bodhisattvas and flowers all around, things that are beautiful, ephemeral, birds, uh, things that are free. Um, again, kind of talking about how um, maybe the revolution works out for some but maybe it's not what it could be. Maybe it's a revolution in herself. This one, uh, we see another sex worker. Um, and it's interesting that she uses the grasshopper and flowers. Again, beauty is ephemeral is a pretty standard way of interpreting flowers. We do have some of these um, Zen one stroke circles around, uh, but the grasshopper may represent childhood. Uh, in China, and maybe if you're from another culture, you may have done the same thing. You catch a grasshopper and put it in a box, and that's your friend for the day. And it talks about the days when you're young and you were free uh, and you could do what you wanted. Uh, and that was the type of freedom that a lot of people would like to have. I'm saying it now, and I want this type of freedom. <laughs> 